Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the IBS Freedom Podcast. I am joined by my stellar co-host, Miss Amy Hollenkamp, R to the D. Hey, everybody. <laughs> and today we're talking about the gut-brain axis. Oh, my gosh. Girlfriend, where do we begin? Honestly, like, where do we begin? Because it's a two-way street. So we could start with the gut. We could start with the brain. It's a two-way right. highway. Well, I, I'd almost like to start... And I know we've talked about this briefly in other podcasts of just how it's perceived in in the conventional space. Because I, mm-hmm. I do think that, you know, when we think of gut issues, a lot of times, even the conventional sphere is like, oh, yeah, there is like a brain gut connection, but it's almost viewed as a one way street. I know you had mentioned it is a two way street. And I think that that gets a little lost sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're either thinking like, oh, my stress or anxiety is driving, um, some gut dysfunction via the brain gut access, um, or trauma is causing problems with digestion and motility. But I think rarely does the conventional sphere take into account how the gut microbiome inflammation can drive issue inflammation in the, in the brain and the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I love like Datis Karazian's work in this yeah. area. And I, I think it can really be summed up as as if the gut's on fire, the brain's on fire and vice yep. versa, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think one of the key attributes of the brain gut axis is that it's just so, it, there's so much interaction both ways. And I would try not to like, just think of it, think of it as a brain down but also a gut up. I think that uh, that's the area that people tend to miss a little bit more. I don't know to compare. I feel like, go ahead. Yeah. I I think in the conventional space. Yeah. There. And honestly, I find that it's often like a cop out of like, "Ah, we don't know what to do with you. You're a difficult patient. So it's just your anxiety causing your IBS. So I feel like it's not even that the conventional world really appreciates the gut brain axis it's like an excuse like eh, it must be in your head whatevs but then right. obviously with that with that exact tone but then similarly i think that a lot of like what i'm seeing on facebook and social media and like the gurus a lot of people want to talk and like in my profession in functional medicine a lot of people talk about like oh your depression is caused by your gut or your anxiety is caused by your gut so it's like they're acknowledging that direction more so right. but then maybe not working on the brain-based support in order to heal the gut so it's right. kind of funny like the two halves are separate yeah i totally get what you're saying about the functional space being much more like the gut is driving everything yeah and that blind the blind and i think that goes to show too like what's in the SIBO space how you can get so blinded by the overgrowth and yeah. the bacteria is causing all the problems and the gut environment's causing all the problems that you can fail to see these other systems that are complex and in, in creating some of the gut dysfunction yeah. from the nervous system. So, I mean, I think it's, I think it's good that we can see both sides of the, the coin where you need the brain and the nervous system to be healthy, but you also need a, a, a good, diverse functioning microbiome and gut environment so that there's balance in the brain gut access. Yeah. And for those of you listening at home too, like this might be a little jargony already. And access is just a connection between two systems. Right. So we talk about like, you know, the adrenal hypothalamus pituitary axis. And it's just to say that those things are connected or the the brain gut axis or the skin gut axis. It's just like a medical jargony way in papers that they talk about things being connected. Right. And it's always a two way street with any sort of axis or in the HPA, it's a three way street. Um, But I think, yeah, for some people you need to focus a lot on the gut to heal the brain. And it can be, you know, like 80, 90% of the work can come from one side of the equation. And similarly, sometimes there are people where you need to work 80 or 90% on their brain in order to heal the gut. And then some people are more of a mix of like 50, 50, maybe you need to do a bit of each. It really depends on the case and what makes the most sense for you as an individual. Right. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, 
I think that we could probably start, do you want to start with the gut in general and sort of how the gut communicates and to the brain? Do you want to start there? Yeah, we could, we could start there. That's a good point. Okay. Um, I I, figured, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you go. <laughs> I was just thinking like, you know, I, I have some images. I don't know how I could share them. I don't know if we have like website wise places to share or links or of stuff, but I know like I've created some like models of how mm. the brain and the gut are connected. Yeah. I think visualizing it helps because it makes it much more clear how each of these pieces connect and we'll talk about it here. So it might be, there might be a visual forming in your head just from us talking, but yeah. having a picture of it, I think helps. Yeah, too. we could do that. And we probably should like get around to making a specific Instagram account for this podcast or something. Right. But in the meantime too, like if you guys don't follow Amy on Instagram, like do it because you, you have way more interesting content on Instagram than I do. I'm kind of on a, my thing is YouTube. I'm on YouTube yeah. every week, but otherwise I'm kind of like, eh, social media. Um, I haven't yeah. been as active. So go follow Amy right now. But yeah, to paint the picture, I think there's two predominant ways that the gut is going to communicate with the brain. And you can throw in others if I'm forgetting some, but the two that really come to my mind are either directly because so first off anatomy lesson, the main connection between the gut and the brain is your vagus nerve. It's one of your cranial nerves, comes down out of your brain stem, goes to the gut, and it tells the gut what to do. So it's a pretty big deal. It's the biggest nerve in your body. Well, longest, I should say. The sciatic nerve is the thickest. But it it is the commander in chief for the gut. And the vagus nerve, for all that we think of it, like the vagus nerve tells the stomach what to do, or the vagus nerve tells the intestines what to do there's also a sensory component or an afferent component where there's stuff going up. So it's perceiving the world in the intestines and the stomach, and it's perceiving discomfort and cramping and abdominal pain. And it's also picking up microbial compounds and bringing them back up to the brain. And they've done some really funky, scary studies where they do a vagotomy. They cut the vagus nerve and then, but have you heard of these studies? And yeah, like, they the, make me like, it makes me feel pain. Yeah, like it makes me weep internally to hear that. Right, right. But they take like a mouse model of Parkinson's disease and they do a vagotomy and then the mice don't get Parkinson's anymore. And, you know, bless their hearts. And I say that with all the sarcasm that it's meant to be with in the South. But, you know, conventional medicine, they're just like, there, there's the solution. So I shudder to think if they think they should do vagotomies on humans a lot. But it's because we think it's because the vagus nerve is picking up microbial metabolites and Lord knows what is picking up and it's right. shuttling it up to the brain. So right. there's that direct anatomical highway of the vagus nerve. And then the second thing that comes to my mind is that your gut is where most of your immune system lives. And therefore it has the greatest potential to cook up boatloads of inflammation Mm -hmm. And if you have a lot of inflammation coming from your gut, those cytokines, those signaling molecules circle around and then some of that gets to the brain. And now you've got some inflammation in that's getting up to the brain as well. So those are the two that came to my mind. How about you, Amy? Yeah, no, uh, those are the main ones that I'm thinking of too. I think if the gut's leaky as well, if there's leakiness and lipopolysaccharides mm -hmm. are like, you know, directly inflaming the brain, in, in ways as well. That's another one that I'm thinking of, but usually that's going to kick off cytokines. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And going to play a role in the, the immune response and the inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. So those are the main ones that I'm thinking. And, and an interesting point too, that you're saying is that like byproducts of the gut are leading to, um, you know, messages are being sent from the gut to the brain and one thing that's really fascinating that I don't think's talked a lot about in the gut health space is like how important short chain fatty acids are yes. for the brain. Mm -hmm. So I do want to comment a little bit on that because I mean, if you're cutting fibers, which we know is popular in the IBS SIBO space, if you're cutting fibers, usually things like butyrate and really important short chain fatty acids drop. Mm -hmm. So it could be creating, I mean, it creates inflammation at the gut if you're if your microbial diversity is going down and your 
your bifido bacteria are going down. But I also wonder if there's, you know, directly affecting the brain by lowering butyrate. Um, have you ever thought about that before? Yeah, a little bit. I, I think um, I haven't had any cases yet where I thought to do butyrate specifically for the brain, but that might be the bias of the patients that I work with. Um, right. Like pretty much everybody has some sort of gut problem that works with me anyway. Um, right. But yeah, I, I was recently curious about this. You tapped into something that we haven't really talked about much yet, which is I've been sending out stool tests left and right recently. Yeah. Like all, all sorts. I think I've done four on myself and I conned my husband into doing three. And I'm just, I'm trying to check in with myself again and find like my ideal stool test for my right. clinical practice. And it depends what you're looking for. But one of the things that came back when I did some stool testing on myself was low butyrate. And I was like, ooh, that's not good. And I started trying to reconcile with like, oh, but am I just absorbing it better? Like fecal butyrate levels might not be super useful. Right. So I don't know. I'm still wrapping my head around what all this means. And I'm waiting for another stool test to come back in to kind of give me more clarity on this. But recently I thought to supplement with butyrate in hopes it would make my sleep a bit better because I don't really get a lot of deep sleep, apparently, according to the Aura Ring. Um, I haven't seen anything noteworthy yet, and I've been dosing up on it pretty heavily, but it could just be that it's not the thing that's giving me crappy sleep. I don't know. Right, um, right. So yeah, so for myself, I thought about butyrate specifically because of my gut test, but also thinking like, ooh, this might be my ticket to better sleep, but I don't, I don't know if I've seen a difference for myself yet. Uh, but I do use butyrate supplements a lot for like IBD, IBS, Right. inflammation, autoimmunity, uh, pretty much everybody who's on a low FODMAP diet, when they first come to see me, I have them start on a butyrate supplement because I assume that they're not making enough. Yeah. Um, so I do use it as a broad anti-inflammatory. How yeah, about you? No. What's, what has your experience been with butyrate? Yeah, I, I like butyrate too. Um, I think that it, it can be really beneficial if there's like permeability going on or suspected, highly suspected permeability and mm -hmm. signs of that. Um, yeah, but it just, I, it's just something that's really interesting from the brain gut standpoint and could be another reason to be a little careful with low FODMAP because mm -hmm. it could have ramifications to, from the nervous system standpoint mm -hmm. um, in more ways than one, but with a butyrate reduction of going low FODMAP it just makes me even more cautious about doing that longer term. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I agree. Um, I think to one of the two bacteria that is consistently suppressed on a low FODMAP diet is a big old butyrate producer, Fecalobacterium prudsnitsii. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if I've seen any studies yet where they take people, put them on low FODMAP and then measure their butyrate in of itself, although fecal butyrate might not be the most useful marker anyway, honestly. Yeah. But um, fecal bacteria presidentiae pretty much always goes down in the studies that I've seen. So yeah. even if, even if, you know, even if you have other butyrate producers, I don't know, I would want to keep fecal bacterium around. Uh, so that is a possible issue. Also, I love how easily fecal bacteria rolls off your tongue because sometimes right. i'm like oh what fecalibac like just reading it like looking at it you're like uh, i think i said it right but listening to you like gives it like a gives it fresh gives <laughs> it fresh in my mind oh um, good yeah I, I will say too like one of the my favorite examples of how how devastating like certain gut inflammation can be to the brain um, I pulled up some stats uh, that there was a, there were some, I think it was one study and they looked at people that had IBD mm -hmm. and 42% uh, of people with Crohn's in the study and 46% of people with ulcerative colitis had white matter lesions in their brain mm -hmm. um, from the inflammation. So, I mean, that's wild to me. Um, and I Terrifying think it, is the word I would use. Right, yeah. right. And it, it goes to show you how much that inflammation in the gut. And with IBD, you're going to have more extreme inflammation than with IBS usually. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but it is really interesting that you can see that 
distinction mm -hmm. of okay if there's tons of inflammation in the gut you can literally see these white matter lesions developing in the brain yeah so that's wild uh, to me and a really good example of how the inflammation gut can drive inflammation in the brain yeah yeah it's um i think it goes to show you well like you said if your gut is on fire your brain is going to be on fire right and this is something that unfortunately like modern medicine and functional medicine to some extent we're not good at understanding the brain on fire super super well from like a testing standpoint um, Cyrex has a test that looks for leaky blood brain barrier, and we could get to that a little bit later. And that can be sometimes useful. Um, and then some people will try to do like urinary neurotransmitter tests and extrapolate and think about the brain. But I think that those are really, <clears throat> pardon me, more reflective of gut neurotransmitters rather than CSF. Um, I think shy of doing a spinal tap, you really can't get a glimpse at what's going on in the the central nervous system. I think that we just have to go based off symptoms and the research studies that we have where they use mouse models or post-mortem studies or, you know, surgical procedures. But white matter lesions is a good example of something that the modern medical world can see. Yeah. Whether they think it's relevant or they make a note of it, maybe, <clears throat> if they're progressed enough. Right. Um, but I think, you know, medicine as a field they're good with things that are really like glaring in your face bam and if it's not like a big honking tumor or blatant white matter lesions you could still have brain inflammation and have a totally normal looking mri or ct and you know i've had patients where they get some testing done their doctor says you don't have inflammation you're good and then like on to the next patient um, so just keep that in mind, too. Like, brain inflammation is not something that's really clear on testing, necessarily. Right. Like, you really have to go based off symptoms and how much brain dysfunction you appear to have. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that. Because um, we talked about how the gut can can communicate to the brain. So it can be directly through the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. It can be through cytokines and the inflammatory response. Yep. Yeah. But once that inflammation is happening in the brain, um, there's usually the ones that I talk about, the cell, the microglial cells mm -hmm. um, tend to, they're basically the brain's immune cells start to kick yeah. off inflame, inflammation. And it's kind of like a domino effect. They have a hard time shutting off once yeah. they get turned on, mm -hmm. which sucks. I mean, I think like that's what makes it hard to shut off neuroinflammation is that these microglial cells, once they're turned on, it's like hard to contain the inflammation. Um, and I mean, once these, these cells are all turned on, a lot of your neurons are going to operate a lot slower. Um, so cognition gets really heavily affected. Um, things like brain fog, uh, poor concentration I see often, mm -hmm. um, word finding issues. I don't know if you see that mm -hmm. often, but that's something that people tell me all the time. Like I used to be like so good at just speaking without problems, but I'm having trouble finding words. Um, definitely. And we've talked about this before, like anxiety, depression yeah. coming up, um, it's sleep it, issues. It, sleep yeah. issues. I would say that the anxiety depression we've talked about this as well sometimes like it comes out of the blue mm -hmm. like where mm -hmm. there it seems to have followed gut issues mm -hmm. um and sometimes it's before and we can talk a little bit more about that but those are probably the big things that i see also um something that that Datis talks about a lot is like handwriting quality i do mm -hmm. look for that too yeah. Because if your coordination somehow is declining, whether it's handwriting or you notice like, oh, I used to be like really good at this, but like I seem to have lost a little bit of coordination, that can also be a sign that you're having some inflammation uh, in the nervous system. Hmm. Yeah, and I think um, I remember actually when I was doing, hold on, <clears throat> pardon me guys, I'm a little bit histaminic today or something, I don't know. Um, I clearly had something that ticked off my body, but, um, I remember when I was studying 
functional neurology more intentionally. And when I was doing a lot of Karazian seminars, uh, I remember getting this distinct impression of like, oh man, Karazian's analyzing my brain lesions. Right, like, right. Every time I talk to the guy, I can, it's just like that like beautiful mind calculating, like beep, boop, boop, beep, boop, 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 and he's like right. honing it on my stuff. Um, and he's just, he's a brilliant human being, but I did get that impression from him. And I remember there were moments where, <laughs> I'm gonna use a couple of examples just because they're really funny stories. So I was privileged enough to go to grad school in Southern California and I got to see Dati speak a lot back in the day. Jealous. And it was awesome. Yeah. And I never forget a couple of factors. I remember, um, A, just this like feeling like he's he's analyzing everything I do. And then, you know, you, you hear him speak and he's like, you know, the moment the patient comes into the office or prior, he's analyzing stuff. Like if you are, and I've had patients like this, like, oh, they're 15 minutes late and you know, they seem like really frazzled, like that could be another window into like how well your brain is working. Mm -hmm. Or again, like you said, like searching for words or really forgetful or, you know, complaining of a lot of brain fog, uh, all of those could be indications. And <laughs> I remember one time, my friend, Mamie and I went to the seminar, I think it was the Mastering Blood Chemistry seminar. We went down and it was at a hotel because like if seminars are, and it was one of those hotels that put out those little like peppermint chocolate things. What like are they like? The, bed. Little, the rectangle things? No, not on the bed. It was worse. It was like on the tables in the conference center. Okay. They had like, like a little- Like Andy's mints, kind of like that? <sighs> yes, that's what it was. Thank you, Andy's mints. And they were just like in little dishes all throughout the conference center. And the seminar ends and we lingered and to ask questions or hang out or something because there was a bunch of us there. And at the end of it, it was like Datis and maybe two other doctors were off talking off to the side. And Mamie and I we were like, oh, look at all this free chocolate. And we were students, first of all. But we were like, okay. And we went through the room and we picked up all the chocolates. <laughs> We had this arm load of these Andy's mints. I mean, may not maybe that many, but we had like a good solid wealth of chocolates. We were like, this is amazing. And we go home or wherever we went. The next day we go to the seminar and Datis starts talking about dopamine. And he's like, yeah, you can spot a dopamine person a mile or a person who needs dopamine a mile away because they're chocolate addicts. And they'll like scrounge up any chocolate. And I just remember the way he worded the, the, the way he talked about it. I was like, Oh, he was judging us last night for doing oh that. He thinks gosh. I'm like hardcore dopamine deficient. <laughs> but it was so beautiful. I would not change a damn thing. Those were delicious and it was worth every little bit of, of uh, judging I might have gotten from Karazian. But, uh, but yeah, there's little things like you could just observe human behavior and pick up on stuff like that. And it's really interesting the more you know about the brain. But that was one of mine where I, I showed my brain lesions quite, oh my gosh. quite uh, externally. Um, but anyway, where were we before that? Just, yeah, the microglia, learning about this stuff freaks me out, honestly. And right. I, I uh, similar vein, I have another story. I was in Datis's Neurotransmitter in the Brain course. First time I took it, I think. And I'm sitting there next to my friend, Mike Toka. And Datis is going off for like 20 minutes about concussions and how bad they are and how they fire up your microglia and you can't really turn them off and da, da, da. And I literally lean over to my friend and I go, man, I'm so glad I haven't had a concussion before. And I went back to sitting there and learning. And then I had this epiphany like 10 seconds later and I was like, oh, Toka, I have had a concussion before and it was a bad one. Nobody calls it a concussion. Yeah. That was my problem. I hit my head and I lost consciousness when I drank the creep water, but <laughs> nobody called it a concussion and my coaches didn't give a crap. So yeah. I went on marching through my life and it wasn't until 10 or more years later that I had that revelation and realized, oh my God, I had a bad concussion and I had no idea. So I sure as heck, I wasn't taking turmeric or fish oil or whatever for the eight or 10 years prior to that. Um, oh. It was pretty cray. But yeah, I get paranoid learning about some of the stuff sometimes because I wonder like, oh God, did that concussion doom me to a lifetime of inflammation? Yeah, um, but well, good. I was just gonna say you could do things to mitigate it um, for sure, and we'll get into some of our favorite therapeutics and things that you could do for it. But yeah, hopefully you all aren't feeling too doomed as you learn about this, because sometimes I go down that rabbit hole and I have to like pull myself back up. 
Right. Well, I think that if we ever develop merch for this podcast, we have to get like a shirt that says don't drink creek water. Oh my god, that'd be amazing. Because, well, first off, I think it could have like had some parasites or something in it. Oh, and I'm then sure. You had like a double whammy that day. Yeah, um, it was rough. Yeah, I think that the, uh, it'd be interesting because uh, I do have people where I always ask about concussions yep. when I'm taking intake and we can talk a little bit more about how concussions affect the brain gut access. But I always ask, and I would say I'm always cognizant of the age that the person mm -hmm. had the concussion because mm -hmm. usually if it happens earlier, I mean, depending on how bad it is, but I'd like to hear, like, Datis, does he sort of talk about age of when the concussion took place being a factor or um, not? I don't think I've really heard him talk about that. Um, I, he definitely talks about just hits to the head. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. And I know he's talked about, like, the severity of the hit doesn't necessarily, like, correlate with the, the severity of the inflammation that's instigated from it. But, yeah, I don't know if he's talked about the age. Um, I do think that probably a, a bad head trauma at an early age is probably even more detrimental than later on in life. I think that's what you're getting at. Well, yeah. I mean, I think that there's also, uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically what I'm saying. I, I think that, you know, you have to kind of gauge what has, when did the digestive, if you notice any mm -hmm. digestive things after the concussion or was, was health affected in any way? Like after yeah. that concussion, were there any like depression, anxiety come out of nowhere? Or like, was there anything that you noticed after that concussion that's of note? Yeah. Those are the things that I try to look for. Yeah. Um, and likewise, I think like where it happened, um, like I know for me, I had the concussion in May and then like September, October, I think was when my physical performance, like my athletic performance as a rower started to really tank. I also didn't practice much over the summer. Honestly, I just rested. So it might've been affected earlier too. And that's when I started getting low back pain, which then yeah. I was able to correlate with the gut. So I definitely noticed that for myself. Right. Yeah. And I think that like, I think when we're talking about the brain down, so like the communication of the brain to the gut, from a very simplistic standpoint, it and it gets lost a lot because so much focus is in the gut, I feel like, from a functional space. But digestion and motility is an autonomic process. So if the brain isn't healthy and well and can't communicate effectively to the gut, your gut's always going to be... Uh, functioning subpar. Yeah. Uh, so it's such a crucial piece to gut function. I mean, it's where like you're going to get stomach acid secretion. It's going to promote enzyme release. It's going to dictate motility and blood mm -hmm. flow and nutrients. To the gut. Yeah. I mean, there's so many like, um, because it is an autonomic process, like it, yeah. it's brain-based. You're not telling your body to digest food now. It it knows what it's it's supposed to know what to do but if there's misfire in that process then it's not going to be able to help you digest and absorb food as properly as it should yeah and that's the thing is like i tell some some of my patients like your your stomach doesn't just make stomach acid because it wants to or because it thinks right. it's a cool thing like your stomach makes stomach acid when it is told to do so by the brain end of story and your pancreas will make pancreatic juices when it's told so by the brain and the list goes on and on but like you have to get that signaling in order to do anything with your gut and it's beautiful like in a way i think that a lot of my patients would prefer on some level like when they first work with me at least i think a lot of them fathom that they would prefer if they could tell their gut what to do like hey you Stop right. being bloated and hey, you make stomach acid. And oh, by the way, do this. And like that seems appealing, but it would actually be the biggest pain in the ass. And it really nobody would. would be happy. Or like if you had to tell your heart, beat now, beat again, 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 <laughs> like, we would drive ourselves insane. So we have this totally automatic, autonomic, 
unconscious part of our nervous system that just takes care of it for us and doesn't have to burden our frontal lobes and our conscious brain with it. And then we could do other stuff like, I don't even know, like do podcasts. So it's really a wonderful thing. But I do think that people who are deeply frustrated with their guts frequently think like, if only I could tell my gut what I want it to do. It's like, you actually are. You're just doing it with the unconscious part of your brain. You wish you could do it with the conscious part of your brain. That's different. And that would suck. Don't wish for that. Um, But to that point, maybe let's uh, start thinking about some therapeutics. What are some of your favorite things to do to encourage good, healthy gut brain access work in your patients? Yeah. I I mean, what I try to emphasize again, is it is a two way street. And like you were saying at the beginning, some people need more heavy brain interventions and some people need more gut interventions. Um, a lot of times what I try to do if there's a gut related thing is control inflammation. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, that, that, that's a, sounds really simple, but it can be more complex. So it's control inflammation. It's all good. Yeah. If they need like pruning of bad actors, if they need to build up some of the good gut bugs, we'll focus on that. Sometimes I'll focus on using things like immunoglobulins to sort of calm the inflammation in the gut. Um, well, sometimes again, we'll work on just, uh, trying to modulate the gut environment from a bar- variety of different angles. That tends to be how I approach it from a gut standpoint. Um, sometimes I will say too, like if someone needs some support, um, for like just digesting and that's kind of like if the brain's not operating optimally as an intermediate strategy, providing some support digestively can mm-hmm. be important so that you're actually absorbing nutrients and yeah. and, and that sort of thing. Um, I would say from like the brain down, so like how to support the brain, I would focus heavily on things that help to turn the microglia off. Mm-hmm. So things like curcumin, mm-hmm. um, I like, I like resveratrol too. Like there's some, uh, I would say those sorts of things, sometimes omegas, a lot of times mm-hmm. I'll try to get them to incorporate more, um, more fatty fish in their diet if they mm-hmm. can. So uh, those would probably be the, the main things. Sometimes if, if the brain gut axis is impaired too, I'm going to be more likely to do things like prokinetics. Mm -hmm. help support motility. Um, Those would be the main things that I would say I I do. Are there anything in particular that you do? Yeah, I think that the the gut up, I'm in line with you. I think, you know, support the gut, the local environment, however you need to support it. So Mm -hmm. feed the good guys, inhibit the bad guys. Um, I use a lot of prokinetics, uh, fair amount of probiotics, lots of fiber and prebiotics and food. Um, I will do butyrate supplements quite often, especially if somebody's been on low FODMAP for a long time yeah. and I don't think they're producing enough or if they have a really restricted diet from another restrictive diet sample, you know, if they're doing like AIP or if they're doing, you know, low histamine or low oxalate, sometimes I'll get those people on oxalate or, um, not oxalate. <laughs> they would hate me. Um, I get them on butyrate supplements also as a, a anti-inflammatory, at least for a period of time. Um, so I think most of that we're pretty we're pretty much on the same page with. And I like some of the nutrients that you rattled off for the brain. Um, You know, curcumin is great, resveratrol, omega-3s, green tea and sulforaphane. Also, I use a moderate amount of either as a food or as a supplement, depending on the case. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, if you could get some synergy with these compounds, then, you know, dosing turmeric and resveratrol together is a greater effect than either of the two alone if you were to add those together. So that can be really helpful to get synergy. Um, probably my my best interventions, that is always a, a matter of if people are willing to do it and willing to do the work. Uh, fasting has been profoundly, profoundly wow for me personally. Mm-hmm. And I've started having some patients work on doing some legit fasting and that's been really profound for a lot of my patients. Uh, nobody relishes the thought of not eating for a day or two. But once people do it, as long as they're not like horribly hypoglycemic, most people are like, oh, that was easier than I thought. And I feel really good. 
And I always joke with my husband when I do one of my fasts, I tell him, I'm like, I feel like I went to the new brain store. Like all, all the synapses are synapsing. I feel like a million bucks. I have no brain fog, no fatigue. I'm like super productive. I feel like a new human. So I've just gotten in that habit of doing like a three day fast every other month for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try to encourage patients when I think it's appropriate to do that. Um, or like a shorter, you know, a 24 hour fast and then you can work your way into a, a bigger one if you want. Um, so that's my number one. Um, I think acupuncture can be helpful if yeah. people are willing to spend the additional money on acupuncture. And I think yoga is fan freaking tastic. And with the advent of online courses and YouTube, I mean, you could find enough yoga on YouTube to keep yourself occupied through the pandemic. And then when we're out of the pandemic, you can join a yoga studio. But I do think that yoga teaches a specific uh, type of like body awareness and patience and like their mantra of like, stay on your own mat and don't, don't look at Suzanne who's doing a handstand next to you. Like focus on your own shit. Like, I think that's really intrinsically healing to the gut brain axis. Yeah. Um, again, it's just, you know, if, if somebody's already working with me and, and spending a fair amount of money on that, and then it's like, oh, by the way, spend a hundred dollars a month on acupuncture and another hundred dollars a month on a yoga studio. Sometimes they've got to pick and choose and like do some of it on YouTube or whatnot. Um, but yeah. all of those I think can be really helpful too. Yeah, I love that you brought up the yoga piece and the acupuncture. I've seen that certainly be helpful. The yoga piece and any really activity too that's focusing on like coordination centers of the brain, I think can be really helpful. Um, I also am curious too, I think we've talked about it in in past uh, podcasts as well. And there's some overlap, I think, with like hormonal stuff with this too. But I know... um, a lot of people with IBS have trauma Mm. and it might be like very past, like past trauma. And sometimes even working with a psychologist as well to discuss um, past traumas and work through uh, those issues can be profoundly healing as well. I I know we've both agreed and talked about in the past. Um, Or even too, if people aren't super into the idea of doing talk therapy, because that doesn't appeal to everybody, or maybe they've tried it before. Um, A lot of my patients have done really well with more like somatic therapy work, where it's more focused on like, how does your body feel? How does your body feel when you're anxious? How does your body feel when you're relaxed or when you're doing something you enjoy? I probably like, I'm not a therapist, so I'm probably bastardizing it, but you know, the, the somatic type of therapies can be helpful. And also I've had some patients do really well with EMDR and they've said that it's been like life-changing where talk therapy wasn't as helpful for them. Mm -hmm. Um, that's something on my, my to-do list at some, I want to like try a session or two of EMDR just so I can talk about it better. Like, I don't really know exactly what the therapy entails. Um, but I've had several patients say that EMDR was like world changing for them. Yeah, no, I've definitely heard that too. I have some friends locally who are, one of my friends uh, owns a pretty popular psychology group here. Hmm. It's mainly women centered. She has hmm. a lot of like women's empowerment stuff and she's kind of had worked in the eating disorder hmm. vein for a while, but they do a lot of EMDR there from what I hear. And again, I'm not like an expert at it either. So it'd be interesting to, to do a session or to hear about you doing a session, you being the guinea pig, but I like uh, being a guinea pig, so I'll do it. Yeah. But from what I hear, they almost lock in on the trauma and then Mm -hmm. bring you into that traumatic experience and somehow you entering it, seems to make it less and less painful Hmm. and i don't know how it's done but i know there's something with eye movement too yes yes correct yeah so i listened to a podcast where the guy on the podcast talks about his emdr Hmm. and that's kind of how he describes it as Hmm. you know it's like his therapist is like oh i think you're ready and then they like dive into like they're just talking randomly and then it goes very deep into this like trauma and Mm. it's like a very visceral like remembering it in a particular way Mm. 
again, I don't know the all the ins and outs, but I know it's like bringing you into the trauma and then it becoming less and less painful. Hmm. Well, and it's interesting. Um, I have a good friend of mine who's a psychiatrist. He's a nurse practitioner. And one of these days I've got to ask him to be a guest on the podcast because he's very, I mean, he's worked in a conventional psychiatry practice for many years, but he's very integratively minded and like tries to recommend natural therapies whenever he can. And I know that he's, he's actually the one that introduced me to EMDR and told me about it. Yeah. And I've recommended it to patients. Um, so he would be a good person for us to interview about like the different types of therapy and like the different types of tools for that piece. Cause honestly, like, I do think that trauma is held in the body somehow, mm -hmm. whether it's like physically or energetically or whatever. I think that probably if you have a significant trauma, there is merit to working through that in whatever way you can. There's other things too, like there's chiropractic techniques even. There's one called NET. I think it's a neuroemotional technique, but NET chiropractic, they will, I was never trained in it. So don't quote me on this. Hopefully chiropractors don't hate me for this um, if, I, if I totally get it wrong. But my impression, just learning about it a little bit in school was that um, you talk to the patient about whatever their trauma was and then have them focus on some some positive aspect or to like take their mind to a happier place and then deliver the adjustment and somehow like coupling like a little bit of like acknowledgement of the trauma and working through that to some degree and then doing a chiropractic adjustment that can help release some stored trauma in the body uh, but i've heard some things from colleagues about net being really really profound too so there's more than one way to pet a cat and there's a lot of different types of therapy or a lot of different ways that you could try to work through your stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think trauma, you know, there's been studies where they show if you have, what is it like the ACEs, the, uh, the childhood, something or other, I'm not getting this either. Um, but there's like a scoring system where like, if you had a parent who was abusive or a parent who was an alcoholic, or if you got molested at a young age, or if you had, you know, this list of trauma, and if you score more than a certain number on that, like you have much, much higher risk going forward into adulthood of having conditions like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue mm -hmm. and IBS and autoimmune diseases. So I do think that there's something to like the trauma piece of it as well. And that can definitely affect the gut brain axis. Yeah, I think. I kind of think of it as being wired, your brain starts to become wired a certain way if you've had trauma, mm -hmm. like from early on. And if you're wired to be more in a fight or flight state too, I mean, from early on, I just think that's going to affect your physiology in profound ways. Yeah. Um, and again, I don't, I don't think we totally understand exactly how trauma is stored Not in the that. body completely but mm -hmm. I agree with you like I do think that there's a lot of stored trauma that's never been addressed or worked on and mm -hmm. so if there's these if there's some trauma in your past that you've never worked through finding modalities that seem to help and trying a couple things might be a good place to start yeah. um, even something simple to that could help sort of with the rewiring of the brain, like even like meditation mm -hmm. too. It, it might t not totally unpack like all the trauma or, or things like that, but to, to rewire, to rewire the brain in a certain way. Yeah. Um, uh, could be helpful. Yeah. And I think I'll make a note of this. I oftentimes will recommend some sort of meditative practice. And I have a lot of patients who say, Oh, I can't meditate. I tried and I sucked at it. I can't focus. And you know, they kind of write it off. And I always tell people, if you're one of the people who say, I can't do meditation because I suck at it and I can't focus, you are the type of person who needs it the most. Right. So like that's diagnostic. And the point is everybody sucks at it to begin with. And then you gradually get better. But if you're one of those people, a good stepping stone might be maybe you do like a guided meditation or yoga nidra or you have like an audio telling you to relax your pinky finger, relax your wrist, relax your whatever, and kind of give you something to focus on and still relax. 
or like if you could give yourself a visual like if i tried to meditate here in my stupid office like no my brain would be like oh d- what butterfly yeah. but <laughs> yesterday i took a walk and i ended up at a pond and i just sat in front of the pond for a good 30 minutes and then i walked back to my office and i was able to just sit quietly with my thoughts and i had some really great like thoughts and epiphanies on stuff in my life come up and it was very meditative but i wasn't forcing it it's like just look at something pretty i was looking at the fall foliage at a pond that's it (laughs) so that might be a, a happy medium too yeah, I I 100% agree with you. Usually, uh, if someone is struggling with doing any sort of like meditation or breath work or um, anything like that, I would think that <laughs> they probably need it the most, just yeah. as you're saying. And I and speak I, from experience on that front. <laughs> right. And I do too. I mean, I think with me, I definitely feel like brain gut access was a big part of my particular case. Yeah. Um, things that helped me, I think doing curcumin and resveratrol, I noticed pretty significant changes in mood and cognition. Hmm. Um, and this was kind of in the thick of my gut stuff. Like I'd probably say a 50 to 60% reduction in mood and uh, 50 to six, a uh, 50 to 60 percent reduction in things like depression that I was experiencing. Pretty good. Yeah, and then I would say probably cognitively, I was much clearer with less brain fog. Yeah, by similar amount of improvement. So, mm. I mean, that's pretty big, and I remember it being really helpful because I was in school at the time. But I think there was a lot of inflammation. Yeah, going on for my particular case and. So doing brain gut access strategies really helped me. And, and I definitely think working with individuals who have had like either physical traumas with concussions or, you know, have runaway inflammation in their brain, those sorts of strategies can help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and I'll throw this out there too. There was a couple of other uh, therapeutic things that we could talk about as well. Uh, I feel, I, I feel silly because I didn't mention this one before, but the field of functional neurology also is really impactful for a lot of people, particularly, Mm -hmm. I will refer out to a functional neurologist, like I should say I've trained in it, but like I'm not certified and I, I don't use it as much anymore. So I have a background understanding of, of what they're trying to accomplish and like the circuitry, but if, if it's more than what I'm capable of handling in my office, I will refer out to local functional neurology DCs. And, you know, I've got a couple people here that I refer to, but, you know, if there's a lot more like vertigo or uh, like post-concussive symptoms, or if there's something that is really screaming brain-based to me mm-hmm. and I haven't been able to get a hold of it quite yet, I will very frequently send people out for a full functional neurology workup And then depending on the office, like some functional neurologists that I've worked with or I've referred to have like very few bells and whistles. They might have a couple of gadgets, but it's, it's more of just like a hands-on, you know, testing cranial nerves. And then some people spend a lot of money and they have the coolest gadgets on planet earth and they spend gajillions of dollars and they have like this office full of cool toys. And it depends on the flavor of functional neurology, um, but that's something that Karazian has taught a lot on too, is the idea that yes, neuron cell, neurons need glucose, they need oxygen, and they also need stimulation. So you could have the healthiest neurons as far as like the soup that they're surrounded by, and you can diminish inflammation, you can load up on butyrate, you can load up on curcumin, but if you're not using the pathway, it's never going to get stronger. And right. one of the kind of tenets of functional neurology that Deteese has been joking about for years that I always laugh at is whatever you suck at on evaluation, that is your therapy. So the patients who really stink at doing like the, the rapid movement, like this kind of stuff, uh, they do things that involve rapid movement or precise movements. Like, all right, you go learn guitar. Um, or like the people who have slower movements, like almost Parkinsonian-esque where like they can't move their arms and legs quickly or they get stuck. Like, all right, you would do kickboxing. 
or if you have memory problems, like, you know, do luminos luminosity or something to really exercise that muscle. And uh, that's one really good way to go about it. And that goes back to my point with meditation. If you're a person who self-proclaims and says, I can't do meditation, I suck at it. That's the thing you need to do therapeutically. You need to exercise the weak muscle. If you were a dude and you had like the biggest, beefiest biceps ever, like up to here, you know, biceps, if you had giant biceps like this, would you go to the gym and work out your biceps? Yes, because if you're a man, that's what men do. So yes, you would. But logically, like women, let's talk about this. If women had big beefy biceps and scrawny legs, we would usually go, oh, I need to do more leg days. And you would work, you would work on the weak muscle. Bros are all about the arms, Yeah, in my experience. So dudes, you would still do arm day. But... Uh, you get my point. You get the analogy. You exercise yeah. the weak muscle and you do the same thing with the brain. Yeah. I like that subtle diss. <laughs> it's the truth. I, I uh, definitely agree with you. I think whenever I talk about the brain too, and like the vagus nerve, which we're going to probably do a full talk show on. Um, but uh, you know, the nervous system, like you're saying is almost very similar to a, a muscle um, in similar to your discussion on meditation, it's like, you have to exercise a muscle to build strength. It's the same way with nerves. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times, even if someone's struggling to do things that impact vagal tone, I view that as diagnostic. Like, okay, if you're struggling yeah. to gargle, like it's just impossible for you, or if you're struggling yeah. to use certain vagal exercises, to me, I'm like, oh, like you definitely need to do it. It's frustrating on, exactly. on their end because I mean, no one likes to be bad at something, no. but it, it's also uh, can be very informative mm -hmm. uh, if you're not super great at, you know, gargling or yeah, uh, some of these uh, vagal indicators. Yeah, and I think like you can almost approach the brain and the nervous system more broadly as a like, you know, self-improvement exercise. Yeah. Like if you read a self-improvement book and they give you 20 ideas of what to do, you're going to pick the things that you suck at the most or the weak points. And then you're going to work on improving those things first. I would think, I mean, I don't know. I haven't picked up a self-help book in a long time. I listen to podcasts at YouTube, like a civilized person, but you know, you get the idea, like you, you exercise the weak muscle first. And then the goal is to be a well-rounded human thing. Human. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think functional neurology, you know, you can, you can figure some stuff out on your own. Like I just said, like if you have more cognitive kind of stuff, um, maybe luminosity is a thing yeah. for you or playing guitar or whatever. But if you want to get into really nitty gritty specifics and have somebody tell you, you need to draw the alphabet with your right foot and put your left foot in a bucket of sand and you need to spin around three times and cluck like a chicken like that's the kind of stuff, I mean, it wouldn't be that crazy, but it kind of is. That's the kind of stuff where you need to do a full workup with a functional neurologist and they can tell you exactly where your deficiencies are and then give you strategies to exercise those pathways. And then they can reevaluate you from time to time to make sure you're making changes. So that could be really, really helpful. Um, another big broad thing that is probably way beyond the scope of today's conversation that I do want to touch on, particularly for the vagus nerve, but also just the gut brain axis, if you think about it, we're talking about the rest and digest side of your nervous system, which generally we're trying to promote. So that's the house of the vagus nerve. And there's the fight or flight, run away from the tiger, OMG, I'm gonna die side of the nervous system. That's the sympathetic side. And that's the kind of wheelhouse of adaptogens and nervine herbs. Mm -hmm. So you wanna talk about massive, massive, like holy crap improvements ashwagandha, ginseng, elithro, shizandra, holy basil, like those, those types of herbs, even St. John's wort, chamomile, huge night and day differences with a lot of my patients when I get them on a concoction. Usually I'll combine the two. Usually I will do some adaptogens, some nervines, and maybe something else depending on their scenario. But that could be really, really profoundly impactful. And I do think that those herbs you know, we've been saying for years and years in like the functional medicine space and the naturopathic space, 
everybody's been saying, oh, they, you know, they balance the adrenals, they nourish the mm -hmm. adrenals, et cetera. It's probably less to do with the adrenal glands themselves. And I think a lot more of how those herbs work are on the gut brain axis. Yeah. So those adaptogen and nervine herbs, and even some other herbs that you might not think of for that purpose can be really, really, really helpful for that. Um, so I'll just put that plug in from the herbal medicine perspective as well. No, that's awesome. I can't wait for our episode, epi episode, episode? <laughs> e episode on Nervines. I look adaptogen. forward to that episode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, no, I think that's going to be awesome. And I know you mentioned earlier um, things like green tea mm -hmm. as being helpful for the brain. Are there any green teas or teas that you like? I really like peak tea. I don't know if you've tried that mm -hmm. yet. No. Um, no, I tend to, I, I'm kind of an herb nerd. I just buy everything in bulk and I have a big closet full of stuff. Um, so I have like, I forget if I got it from David's Teas or if I used Mountain Rose Herbs. I get most of my stuff from Mountain Rose Herbs. Mm. Um, sometimes I'll do like Star West Botanicals, but yeah, I've got like a, a big one pound bag of loose leaf white tea and loose leaf green tea in the back there. And I, I have little like tea balls that my patients can have some tea with me. I'm always cold, so I'm always drinking tea, except today I'm kind of hot. So I'm actually downing this this mineral water today. I'm kind of hot for once in my life. Wow. I better not have COVID. <laughs> Let's hope not. I I, I just want to, I, I love tea. Like, I love the taste of it. I definitely think I'm pretty caffeine sensitive. Mm. So like, every time I'm like, I'm going to do this tea thing. Like, I always think that I can do it. And I'm like, I'm going to experiment with for like a month or two with some of these green teas. But mm -hmm. I do think that I'm like definitely incredibly sensitive to caffeine just genetically. Mm -hmm. My dad's the same way. Like he'll have, mm -hmm. he had a cup of coffee when he first met my mom. Like uh, at, he went to her house and my grandparents had dinner and he like didn't know to not to like turn it down. And he was like shaking, like so oh. shaky. But I'm the same way. Like even mm -hmm. growing up when I had soda, like I was heavily crashed so I just mm. think and I think when I did my 23 and me I'm like a slow metabolizer of caffeine okay so that would make sense but, but it sucks because I just love it see and similarly like I really wish I liked coffee I did yeah. because like I never did I always thought it was a good thing that I made it through undergrad grad school having a baby and I am not a coffee drinker and I thought oh that's a good thing but now I'm a much more moderate viewer of coffee where like, if you are like my mom who used to drink like eight cups of coffee a day, every single day. And if she didn't have that much, she would have a massive headache and feel right. miserable. Right. She was band-aiding the adrenals for many years mm -hmm. in retrospect. If you're like that, then coffee is a bad thing. But if you are a person like my husband who he just, he likes it and that's like one of his things and he'll have like two cups usually in you know the first half of the day he'll have like two cups of coffee and he enjoys it he could go without it and not get a massive headache but like you know those are the situations where i'm like no i think coffee is good for you because it has been shown to benefit the microbiome yeah. and you know the polyphenols and whatnot in coffee it is good for the microbiome and it's good for the brain like less mm -hmm. incidence of dementia i mean it, it's definitely a good thing for you, but I just, I think it tastes like bitter dirt. I don't like it. Oh my gosh. Uh. No, I, I never got into coffee. Um, it'd be interesting if I tried it. I haven't tried it in a long time either. Like, um, mm. but I have a sneaking suspicion that I'd like probably only like it with tons of sugar, <laughs> <laughs> like where it's like yeah. way less helpful. Yeah. Um, but I, I do really enjoy tea. I just, the caffeine. Speaking mm. of coffee though, what about like coffee enemas for the brain gut? I realize that we haven't touched on that. Is that something you typically use with your patients? Uh, not a ton. And I will say, um, I try to approach medical stuff with some levity when yeah. I can, especially when I talk about things like vaginal douches and enemas, because a yeah. lot of people preferably work with a professional and think, oh, I'll just like eat some more vegetables and I'll take a couple of vitamins. They don't fathom that they're going to stick something up an orifice. Right. When they come in initially, right. like nobody comes in with that goal. 
So I try to approach such things with care and with levity. Um, I do, I, I've, up until now, I've actually had more patients do butyrate enemas and lactulose enemas. Um, as a, and side note, lactulose is a prescription in the United States because we can't have nice things in America. So you would have to work with your prescriber for that. But, um, I have had patients do enemas with either lactulose or butyrate or both. I haven't done as much with the coffee enemas. However, I will say this, um, I have recommended it before and a girlfriend of mine actually swears by them. She had a hell of a case of SIBO. Like that was in the beginning when I was first learning what SIBO was, I think. And she still talks about it. She's like, when Brandon brought, she worked with Brock. She's like, when Brandon Brock diagnosed me with SIBO and like got me on Zyfaxin, like her panic attacks and anxiety just dropped. And she just, she felt like a new person. And one of the things that he recommended was coffee enemas. And she was like, yeah, initially I didn't want to do it, but I, and her husband had SIBO too, funny enough. So they were going through treatment together, Mm. working with Brock. And one of the things that's been really helpful for them that they still do on and off to this day, years later, is coffee enemas. Mm. And she was so cute because we used Marco Polo to talk. And she was, I was asking, I was like, all right, I'm getting ready to try this for myself for a YouTube video. So stay tuned. But I was like, I'm getting ready to experiment with this and do like a, a whole video series on this. Tell me everything you know about coffee enemas. And she took me on Marco Polo around her house and she's like, okay, so here's our enema buckets. We keep them in this closet here. This is the coffee we use. We call it our butt coffee. And she's telling me how they clean it. And it was just so funny how she's like, this is our butt coffee. Oh my God. We keep it in the closet special. Um, But yeah, so I know some people, those two friends of mine who absolutely swear by coffee enemas. Um, It'll be interesting. I'm gearing up to try them myself very soon. And what I've been doing By the time this video launches, it'll be out there, I'm sure, on my YouTube channel. But I've been collecting data with my Aura Ring on heart rate variability. And my intention is now that I have a good month and a half or so of data, I want to see if my heart rate variability changes when I start doing the coffee enemas. So I'm going to do them a couple times a week for at least a couple of weeks. And then I also, I'm I'm going to try to be scientific about it. So I'm going to do coffee enemas, butyrate enemas, and just regular like saline. Um, Mm -hmm. just for like the sake of having that variable accounted for. And then I'm going to use myself as a little N equals one. So yeah, I haven't recommended it a ton though, just because there was some element of like, "Eh, people don't want to go there. How about you? Have you recommended it a lot or seen a lot of the the gospel of coffee enemas? I have the same sort of, I don't know what the word is. Well, I I have the same sort of apprehension about using it as a therapy but I will say I've had people that have done it mm-hmm. with like, or people that have been like, I'm thinking about doing coffee enemas. Do you think that's okay? Mm-hmm. Like if anyone's interested in it, I'm like, and it makes sense for that particular person. Um, I kind of say go for it, but it has yeah. to be more on their end. I'm usually, yeah. I, again, I have never done it myself. So it's hard for me to like really push it on other people. And that's, um, Part of why I'm going to do it is I want to use yeah. myself as a guinea pig and learn firsthand so I can tell them, oh, you make sure you do X, Y, Z. And, you know, I, I want to be able to give that feedback. That's why I got into fasting. I started yeah. doing fasting because I wanted to be able to coach people through it. So I figured, well, I'll give it a whirl. And, and then it just so happens that it makes me feel amazing. And I stumbled on this miraculous thing for my brain. But yeah, say, similar, you know, it's partially because I want to do this YouTube video and be a scientist about it. But part of it is I want to be able to coach people through it. So I'm not just like giving them a handout and saying, good luck. There's a Facebook group. Go find the Facebook group. Well, you're maybe leading me to try it too. We (gasps) could be coffee enema buddies. And then we could call each other from the bathroom floor and be like, hey girl, how's your colon feeling? Yeah. I'm holding it in. (laughs) Can you imagine? (laughs) Oh, that would be glorious. Um, but yeah, I would say the people that have tried it do like it. Like Mm -hmm. I haven't had many bad experiences with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say there's been a few clients, maybe one that I'm thinking of in particular that might've gone a little overboard with, with them. And I'm like, oh, we probably should like settle down on these. I don't think you need to do them like daily or anything Mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I think that 
and I think she liked them so much that mm-hmm. like she's like yeah. okay more is better and I yeah in that situation I don't think more is better um so that was interesting but other yeah. than that I'd say like they're I, I see positive effects from what yeah. I've seen with coffee enemas yeah yeah I think it it seems like I can wrap my head around the mechanism of how they theoretically work Mm -hmm. Uh, So I forget if it's the caffeine or something else in the coffee is cholinergic and it stimulates Mm -hmm. the the acetylcholine, you know, receptors and it's said to be a vagus nerve stimulation. And that's why I've been doing the data with the aura ring, because I want to see theoretically if heart rate variability is influenced by the autonomic, you know, sympathetic versus parasympathetic balance, then theoretically my heart rate variability should change if I am affecting the vagus nerve. If I am exercising that muscle, I should see a difference. And thankfully, my heart rate variability is pretty gosh darn stable from day to day and week to week. So like I have some pretty good baseline data collection behind me and I've been tinkering with it a little bit here or there, but I think I have clear enough baseline now that if I do, you know, like a week of saline, a week or two of butyrate and a week or two of coffee, I think I'll be able to really judge like, oh, yes, you can see the graph go up, you know, here. So we'll that's see. cool. I We should talk about our HRV just in general one of these days because I have my data, too. Yeah. Yeah. I've mine... had it since December of 2019. Okay. Yeah. So you um, have a lot more data than I do. I've only had it about a month and a half. It's it's pretty good. Um, I was curious, too, and this is kind of off topic so might be but i know you were talking about deep sleep earlier yeah have you tried um mouth taping i have and it didn't do much for me unfortunately oh it didn't okay um i have not tried it since the ring i feel like okay. i'm bored of the rings like the ring the yeah. ring um <laughs> oh, so i haven't watch tried out it for, since the ring for Gollum. watch yeah. out for Gollum. um but yeah, I, I tried it years ago because I first stumbled on it. It was Mike Muscle, his, his podcast that introduced me to it. And I was like, mm-hmm. you know, he's talking about like people who don't feel rested when they wake up. And I'm like, man, this sounds like me. And I tried it for a good week and didn't notice anything really mm. profound. Um, you might I do, not be a mouth. Do you breathe through your mouth? I don't think I do. Okay, yeah, that's, that's probably why. I recommend it a ton. But... Yeah, I I used it and definitely noticed a big change I would say more so like I was getting more REM because I was having Mm -hmm. very like interesting dreams. Mm -hmm. So like the, I felt like I was dreaming more. Um, and I did feel a bit more rested. I wouldn't say it was like miraculous or anything, Mm -hmm. but I I did notice a difference. Um, I don't do it anymore because I feel like I don't mouth breathe. Like I sort Mm -hmm. of feel like I adapted. Yeah. Um, but I was just curious about that. It's always yeah. like a fun topic to bring up to people. I always have to like preface it. I always tell, I warn people and I say, uh, like I get to that part of my note taking, cause I ask them questions like, do you snore? Do yeah, you wake do you up cry? with a dry mouth? Do yeah. you, you know, does your spouse say that you snore? Do you need to like drink water all night in the middle of the night? So when I see those questions come up as yes, I, I see that and I make a note to talk to them about it, but I always preface it with, okay, you've known me for all of, I'm going to lift the clock and I'll be like, you've known me for all of 40 minutes. I'm going to make a really weird recommendation, but hear me out. And then I roll into it and and they always give me the same kind of look of like, uh, yeah, okay. And I tell them, I'm like, I know it's weird. I know, but just try it for like a week and see what happens. Yeah. And when I see those yeses and I, I make a point of talking about it, I would say about 70, 80% of the time people report back and say, I'll be damned, it's doing something. Yeah. I feel better, I feel more rested, I'm gonna keep doing it. It's weird, but I'm gonna do it. And yeah. then like 20, 30% of the time, people are like, no way, I hated it. Never again. I'm like, I, I, I agree. I That's about what I'd say too. And it, it's just like such a weird topic to bring up. Cause it, like, I feel like from my end, I'm like, oh, oh Lord, like we got a snore. I got to bring up this mouth tape again. It's and not you... as weird as Animus. I, yeah, exactly. On a scale of weirdness. Vaginal douches, like, all right, we're going to get creative with your vaginal microbiome. Yeah, exactly. I So, but I, I do find that that's helpful, but it might not be a, a part of the equation and in, in your sleep at this point. 
Yeah, not mine. I I have my hypotheses. We'll do a we should do a whole episode on sleep one of you these should. days. And I will say I go I do well on REM and I have always been a person who's had weird dreams. Mm-hmm. Not usually bad dreams, but I have weird dreams. Like I had a dream, part of it involved that I was at a banquet with Liz Lemon and Jenna from 30 Rock. Oh and like gosh. Jenna was pulling a prank on Liz Lemon and like poisoned her wine or something and I was I realized what happened was and I like ran out of the banquet to go talk to Jenna and I was like Jenna what have you done Liz Lemon's on the floor and and then cut to it I'm like in my high school and my best friend is sitting there on a chair with a mask on like it's a pandemic yeah I was like Dan what are you doing here anyway so I I don't have any problem with Ram so it appears from my ring data and the fact that I always have weird dreams uh so yeah but deep I could do better on deep We'll see. YouTubers, leave me comments. Let me know yeah. what has helped your deep sleep. I think I've tried most all of the things except for the coffee enemas and the butyrate enemas, which I will report back on. I tell you, if I get more deep sleep, if I feel like a human when I wake up in the morning after doing these coffee enemas, I'll be a believer. I'll be a lifer. <laughs> You'll be a believer. I will happily squirt coffee up my pooper for the rest of my life if it means that I feel rested and like a normal human being when I wake up out of bed in the morning. So yeah. we will see. We will see. Um, but that being said, I don't know, do we have anywhere else to go from there? I feel like that's like the crescendo of this episode, talking about the coffee out of us and my willingness to put stuff up my butt if it means I get better sleep. Right. Um, yeah, what else have we got? Um, so let's recap, shall we? Mm-hmm. So gut brain axis, two-way street. Some people need to focus on one more than the other. Like for myself with a significant concussion, I probably need to do a significant amount on the brain side of things. Some people maybe can get away with focusing on the gut. I do find that the hippy dippy natural community, like integrated medicine, functional medicine, naturopaths, you know, et cetera, tend to focus more on the gut. And I find that the conventional space will acknowledge the gut brain axis, but in a really condescending shitty way of like, yeah, your IBS is just anxiety. Here, take Zoloft and get out of my face. Um, and it, there are things that you could do from both ends to really work on that. And I agree. I think we should do an entire episode on the vagus nerve. And then we could do an entire episode on like a, adaptogenic herbs and the herbs that I would use for such things. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be, I think, a good place. And other supplements too, beyond just herbs. Um, do you have anything else to add, my dear? No, I think we covered the gist. I don't have anything else to add. Hmm. I don't think I do either. Okay. okay. Awesome. We can well, wrap yeah. it up. Yeah. Well, so that is a wrap guys. Um, as always, if you guys are listening on a podcasting platform, please rate us five stars. That will help us reach more people. Honestly, share, share the podcast with all of your friends. And if you are on YouTube, likewise, share this link with all of your friends. And if you could like this video, comment on this video, subscribe, ring the bell, do all the things you do on YouTube, that will help us grow this channel, grow this podcast, help more people, and basically keep this rad and hopefully entertaining content coming to you on the weekly forever. Or at least that's the goal. So until next time, Amy, my dear, it was a pleasure as always. Thank you. And we'll we'll talk again about gut stuff and coffee on this soon. Mm-hmm.